everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, first, I want to give a, uh, a a special thank you to the eForm folks, uh, Michelle. Um, thank you so much for helping coordinate this. Amy, also, thanks so much for helping put all this together. Uh, it's hard to qualify the important work that the eForum does uh, in, a, in a couple of sentences, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to attempt to, but I can share my own personal experience, and that's that uh, I, I've been tied into a community of, of innovators and people that are making um, technology and uh, social breakthroughs um, as being part of this group, and uh, that, that's why we continue to sponsor it. I'm very proud of what the eForum has done throughout the years, and I'm proud of the direction it's headed in the future. So uh, thanks so much to Amy and Michelle for continuing to march forward with this. Um, second, I want to thank uh, Aaron Stewart, who is here tonight sitting beside me. Uh, Aaron and I um, came to know each other because uh, through work, really. I, I own and operate uh, in, in a law firm that's focused on technology. Um, we have offices in London, Boston, and uh, also in Los Angeles, and a small office in Burlington, Vermont, which is where we started. Everyone always asks why Burlington, Vermont. It's because we started there. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, we came to know each other through work, where uh, Aaron's company, Job.com, acquired one of our client entities. Um, but since then, uh, I don't want to give the full backstory yet because I'm going to tell a little bit more about that. Aaron and I have grown very close and have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. Uh, we have a wonderful time together, and um, Aaron is like at the helm of a very large uh, a company that's that's growing quite quickly. And uh, to be able to take the time to come and chat with us here today is is very much a gift. And I'm. Um, honored not only to have Aaron as a client, but uh, as uh, uh, someone that I trust all of my personal information with and, uh, and and one of my best friends. So I love you, man. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. And the feeling is very much mutual. Yeah. So I appreciate it. So, um, and this is actually, I've done, we've done several events here at MIT, but this is the very first sort of fireside chat thing that I've done. Usually I do myself a favor and get four or five panelists so that they have to do the majority of the talking. Makes it much easier for me, uh, but luckily Aaron has a British accent, which he's perfected, and uh, makes it much easier to listen to than me. So we'll let him do a lot of the talking. I also sound far more intelligent. Yes, really, exactly. But I'm not. I wear, I, I wear my glasses to look more intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anything yeah. we can. Um, I also just wanted to briefly thank uh, you know the Martin Trust Center for allowing us to uh, spend time here. I think it's important to acknowledge them and their continued contributions to the entrepreneurial uh, and continued co uh, contributions and support for the entrepreneurial community. And, uh, and then also all of you guys, the broader community of innovators that have always uh, welcomed us and uh, supported us with open arms. We, we very much appreciate you and hope that we do you a service tonight by providing you with access to uh, knowledge that you wouldn't have access to otherwise had you have not come. So we'll do our best to to not fall short of that tonight. And if I do, I apologize. Um, so that's when I'll give the very first disclaimer of the night. And that is that I might be, I, I'm probably the last person in this room that should be moderating this event. I have probably, you know, the least experience with um, any HR technologies. Uh, maybe not the least, but I, 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 I just want to qualify it a little bit. But uh, Aaron and I can get a good flow going. So that's why we decided to do this. Um, Anyways, without further ado, I'm going to let Aaron go ahead and say a few words about himself and uh, how it is that he's arrived to, to being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Keegan. Yeah. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you for turning up, I guess, to listen to uh, you know, everything that we're here to talk about, which is predominantly all about HR tech. Um, I've been in HR tech industry, rec tech industry, for uh, 16 years. It was everything I've done since I left college. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have some fantastic failures. Uh, during my journey of development of software and platforms and businesses, um, which at the time when they were failures did not feel like something I should have been grateful for. But upon the growth and journey that I've been on, realized that they were the times where I learned the most lessons. 
And uh, it has led me down a journey towards being one of the founders and owner, and my title is Chief Visionary Officer. Um, I once would have classed myself as the chief nerd of job.com, but we now have a new chief nerd who's also in the audience, who is now our CTO. So I'm the second head nerd of the company. I'm delighted to be that. Um, I care about people, okay? And I have dedicated my life and career to trying to find better ways to help people feed their families and pay their bills. We live in a digital world. We are going through digital transformation. Some people like to say digital disruption. I don't like the word disruption. I feel like it sounds uh, uh, counterintuitive. I think transformation is a much more beautiful word to describe what we're going through. And I'm here to transform the way that regular people find work and make it more effective for them so that they can do the basic need that we have, which is to feed ourselves and to pay our bills. Um, and I'm deeply passionate about that. I'm delighted that the journey and the mission that I'm on has been joined by so many fantastic members of the company. And we're all a big family, a big team, very much like Caldwell, have just huge, brilliant culture. And we all have that common goal to try and make things better for people. Um, and I'm never gonna stop doing that because I believe that life is a team sport. So, um, so that's, that's me. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, well, let's just go ahead and jump right in. So I will, can you just, there's a couple of things that I want to define at the beginning of this, right? So when we're talking about HR tech, I'd like to at least it's broad. discuss the meets <laughs> and bounds of what that encompasses before we dive in too, right? So sure. um, a couple of things that I jotted down is that, you know, it includes like payroll and employee benefits and candidate recruitment, but um, can you just give us a sense of like the scope of the, the, the amount of dollars that are involved in this industry and maybe how it's segmented a little bit better than I have here? Sure. So, I mean, you touched on a couple of things, right? So you've got payroll tech, you've got app contracting systems, which I think many of us might be more familiar with because they've been around since the 90s. Um, you've got matching software, you've got job boards, uh, you have aggregators, you have um, benefit systems now and technologies. Uh, you have multi-posting technologies, um, <clears throat> really a vast array of different solutions designed to cater for all sorts of parts of the component of the hiring process. It's a huge, huge industry. Uh, you can break it down into various components, but you know, arguably the holistic market is probably worth somewhere north of 400 billion a year in the United States. Um, half of that comes from the recruitment and staffing industry. Talent attraction, TA tech is probably the other half, and that breaks down into everything from ATSs to payroll tech. Let me just touch on that real quick, because first, that's a massive number. Yeah. Are you making that up? No. Just kidding. No. no. <laughs> so, well, but, for example, is, like, <laughs> the recruitment no. industry was worth, alone, recruitment staff was worth $212.7 billion in 2022. Right. And so that, that's what I wanted to touch on. So like when you talk about like the recruitment and staffing part, that's you know, a couple hundred million of that, that's what we're talking about traditional sort of staffing companies like a Kelly Services or something like that, right? Yeah, but they but they all run a HR tech stack. So um, so again, okay. you know, I, I would say that pretty much every, even traditional human capital business now is tech augmented, even the smallest ones, right? You know, you look at like a system of record solution like Bullhorn, with, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but you know, they serve like 11,000 uh, of the recruitment agencies in America, which is nearly half of every single business registered uh, in, in, in recruitment and staffing. So, I would categorically put them all under one banner. It's all to do with hiring and they're all either proprietary technology or they are tech augmented with off the shelf technology. And then the other 200 million? TA tech, talent attraction technology. So everything to do with app and tracking systems, job board spend, um, uh, chat bots, um, all of the various different components that might sit within inside a marketplace of app and tracking systems for TA tech. Um, Advertising, programmatic, um, social media type. Apps. Yeah, well, uh, some some of that. I mean, programmatic has become very much the prominent player when it comes to advertising to source candidates, which will automatically utilize artificial intelligence to high frequency buy adverts from everything from Facebook right through to Indeed.com, right, and does it all um, at a measurable, trackable price. Um, and again, you know, every dollar that runs through that in order to achieve that again is uh, is a HR tech spend. So TA traction, TA talent traction spend as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've already touched on this just a little bit, but my general impression, like when I think of, I'm from, I grew up in Michigan, not on an MIT's campus and <laughs> <laughs> where I'm from. Uh, I'm from Luton. So yeah, and, I, I, I relate. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my general impression of 
like a staffing company isn't one that has like a sophisticated tech stack, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you know, there's a, uh, you can enter in, there's a job, there's someone sitting at the front that says, okay, you can go talk with one of the recruiters or something like that. And mm. they go, okay, we can try to place you in this entity. And you give them some sort of paper resume, mm. which they maybe scan and put it in somewhere, you know, that gets parsed, you know. Uh, but uh, that's the way that I kind of think about it. And I feel like maybe there's been some tech stack implementation. Obviously, there has for some companies. Yeah. But I guess what I'm getting at is it feels like an industry that has uh failed to keep pace with other industry techno you know other industry technology development and adoption is that something that you agree with and, yeah I, you know, I, why it, is that it is it's by far and away far more primitive absolutely and i think what's probably kept it primitive is the reality is that the recruitment staff in industry has roughly two hundred twenty eight thousand recruitment consultants working in it in america and um it's very much a people business it's still humans to humans um, but the reality is, is that in a world where if you're under 25 years old, the average tenure of your in, in your job is two years and four months. Mm -hmm. It means that the volume of people moving work every year is so vast that you can't just focus on human to human relationships anymore. There physically isn't enough human power to cope with that. So even the most primitive recruitment staffing agency now will have a basic app contracting tech stack like a Conte, and they'll also use a, a MarTech solution like Sense. You know, like even the most basic, because they just can't cope with the level of application flow that, whereas like statistically, if you're over 45 years old, you'll stay in a job for 10 years and four months. Okay. Right. So it, the idea of like generationally back in the 90s, people would move work much less, but now it's just, you know, it's so much more high volume. They have to have some level. 10 of, years though. Yeah. 10, That's not uh, bad. Yeah. Ten, well, there's, uh, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a bunch of data as to why it supports people stay that long after that age. But yeah, but still, for the, for the millennial generation, especially, which is now the, the dominant uh, generation in the labor force, they, move, they are not particularly loyal and they move work a lot. And, uh, and because of that, it's overbearing on any internal hiring uh, solution or external staffing solution to not have even the most basic of HR tech stats to cope with. Yeah. I just want to riff on that, although it's a bit of a sidetrack for my questions here. Does that, uh, talking about the millennial generation, does that kind of dovetail with the great resignation? And are we still, is that done? Or do well, we great, still talk about that? What is it? We, we can still talk about it. I think yeah. it is done. Um, and everyone's got their versions of why the great resignation happened. Outside of uh, job.com, I'm a writer for NASDAQ. So um, I've been a writer for NASDAQ for the last four years. I have my own column. I'm kind of their authority on HR tech, AI, blockchain recruitment. And I wrote an article on the various, it was many factors that made that happen. It wasn't just burnout or anything like that. It was also, you know, people chose the opportunity to reskill and retrain during the pandemic because they suddenly saw their industry decimated and thought, oh, I don't feel as secure anymore. I'm going to move into a market that isn't so vulnerable to negative macroeconomic factors or pandemics. So there are a multitude of reasons that caused the great resignation, but it is done now. It is done. It is done statistically, yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and you think some of that doneness has to do with the ending of the pandemic? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, I call it the great, I, I changed the title from great resignation to the great reflection. So um, everyone had time to reflect on their life their journey and everything that was going on at that time. And it gave people the opportunity to reevaluate their career prospects and potentially the vulnerabilities they had within those careers. And it resulted in a large portion of that generation moving. Does that answer it for you? <laughs> It does. <laughs> I just don't. I don't want to pick on millennials either because I feel like I, I, well, do I feel like I know. It's a generation I know you're a Gen a X. I know you're a Gen X. Just uh, baby, and I barely. And I, and I am a millennial. A geriatric I, millennial. I'm statistically yeah. classed as a geriatric <laughs> millennial. So um, yeah. So yeah, it's fine to pick on us. We can take it. We're we're, th we're thicker skin than you think. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, though, is that I would say, in like the, I would say the majority of em employees at our firm are millennials, and I would I say you're even Gen Z. I think you're Gen Zs, aren't you? Even yeah, we. Yeah. Yeah. You see, you got so a really I know what I'm talking lady. about. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank. You. I'm glad that our HR director came tonight. Um, <laughs> but uh, our experience has I mean, been, you know, a wonderful group of of employees, also. And I think that each, you know, kind of generation has some sort of defining uh, features to it. Mm. And I think that maybe some of that has to do with learning from previous generations about uh, the benefit of moving around and how that helps to create some opportunities for career advancement, possibly. But it's a little bit off Or build a really good culture. 
like or you have at your really culture, company. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. call it how it is. I yeah. think you have a great culture. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so you've been in HR for a long time. And yes. So like what I'm getting at, and even by your own admission, you brought up like, well, even the simplest, uh, you know, staffing agency is going to have some sort of ATS. But previously you'd said these ATSs have been around, you know, since the 90s. Yeah. There's a lot of technology that's been developed, you know, since then to, to make those things more sophisticated. And even like um, I'm even aware of, you know, like uh, I don't know if these are a, 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 an applicant tracking system, I think is like where if I was to go ahead and buy it like for our firm and then people like, you know, apply for jobs and it or takes you to the careers page, which it yeah. looks like it's branded like ours. That's exactly But it's actually age. like that's the applicant tracking system, right? Uh, on our end, at least. Yeah. Is that? That's uh, correct. Do you think that's something that's uh, that we'll continue to see or is that going to get phased out? Or? Well, so, so here's the problem with ATSs, in my opinion, right? So they're there for compliance. Um, and in, nine, in the 1990s, when they first became, you know, uh, fundamentally popular and, uh, you know, the first stage of human resource technology, um, they were far more effective than if some of us can remember applying for a job in the classifieds, right? You're looking through a paper and circling and, oh, is the job still available? You know, uh, that uh, the concept of running through a web 1.0 application process with God knows how many pages, horrible user experience, very unexplanatory, of miserable page loading speeds, never really having no MarTech whatsoever, so knowing if you've actually successfully completed your journey, but it was better than trying to circle an ad in a newspaper. Um, sadly, uh, those uh, uh, platforms have not necessarily, well, app contracting systems, some of them, because there's 365 that currently operate, many of them have not progressed their user experience to cater for the fact that um, an ATS the second that someone touches your company to even apply for a job or anything, they are touching your brand, okay? They're touching the experience of potentially being a part of your company, whether they work for you or whether they're a customer. And this was actually proven by Hilton Hotels. They did a test. Mm -hmm. They gave vouchers to every person that applied for a job at Hilton that wasn't successful to see what happened. And all of those people spent $110 million with Hilton with those vouchers the very next year which means that typically if you're a big company and you're applying for your job, you're probably a customer too, which means you have to provide a brand experience. Applicant tracking systems, which are now nearly 30 years old, many of them have not evolved their user experience to cater for the new digital experiences that especially the younger generation now who don't remember circling classifieds or never had to, are now much more used to the seamlessness of Uber, the seamlessness of DoorDash, the seamlessness of Amazon, and now they're on your terrible app contracting system, going through 16 pages of forms, timing out, logging out, failing, and going, forget this, because this company's archaic. Mm -hmm. So yes, it is HR tech, but it's like saying, well, yes, I've decided to work out this math equation with an abacus. You know, yeah, there is something involved with it, but ar archaic to the very least. Okay, uh, I think that we're going to turn to the live stream now. We've got maybe some questions there. Katie, what yeah, do we have? We have a question about chat GPT and the ATS. Do you think that techno forward-leaning technology like that will have an impact on the ATS? And if so, could you maybe just describe a little bit about how you see that going? Sure. Well, an ATS exists to cope with... Uh, application volume, right? So before an ATS existed and when classifieds existed, you would call and speak to a human and they would run you through all of the questions that they'd need to answer in order to validate and verify whether or not you were a human worth reaching the next stage. You know, chat GPT is in essence a new natural language experience that you'll be able to go through as a chat in a much more fluid, and I guess engaging experience because the technology behind it could be applied to an avatar, it could be applied to you know a, a, some sort of human feeling interface that's within your phone that feels far more conversational and natural in order to extract the information out of the job seeker that you need to complete all of your compliance questions to determine whether or not that person is suitable for the purposes of hiring. And also at the same time, whilst talking through a chat solution like that that's so sophisticated. You're transcribing, parsing, matching, analyzing. Dare I say if it's over video, analyzing facial recognition and heat maps to see if they're lying. And uh, you know, depending on where you're applying for a job, like the government, um, to 
determine whether or not that person's uh, a good fit. So yes, it's uh, it's absolutely going to be a disruptor. I'm, uh, I will say that you know immediately for us as a business, just at job.com, we're already looking at how that could be used. Um, I think it's being slightly media-y bulked up in its capability. I think you imagine that as a platform like that, that's going to have so many various data inputs from so much information because everybody's jumped on this height of chat GPT, it will have a huge amount of sophistication, um, but you'll have to refine that sophistication for the purposes of hiring. Yeah. So I've used it to write job specifications, for example, and it's fairly effective within degrees of um, you know, relevancy, but it can't do specific nuances around a particular, like, you know, why work at Caldwell? Who doesn't know anything about Caldwell? Right. You know, but one day it will. And yeah. when it will, it will, it'll probably sell it better than one of your staff could. Yeah. So, and so it's coming for sure. Mm. Do you, just the, the follow up <laughs> question to that is always will that take people's jobs then? Right? Well, so, well I mean, well, I mean the, the, this, look, this, this, the, the, the forecast over the next decade is that robotics, artificial intelligence, and automation will displace 46% of all labor in the United States, which is 73 million people. Right, so 73 million people that currently work in the US in the next 10, 10 years statistically will not have the jobs that they have now. And it's not people working in warehouses or stacking shelves, quite the contrary. It's actually gonna be people like doctors and accountants. A doctor takes data of human beings in order to diagnose what is wrong with you. We are all the same, right? Artificial intelligence can take all those data points and diagnose you itself. Uh, accountancy is a set of rules for finances that can be done by artificial intelligence. So, so yes, this sorts of technologies will displace many humans that are currently doing jobs now, which is another thing which HR Tech has a responsibility to do, which is utilizing artificial intelligence to create training programs to realign transferable skilled humans into new roles that will not be displaced by technology into the future. Because where we do lose certain uh, jobs and roles, we will gain new ones as we go through the fifth industrial revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Katie, do we have another yes, question from the Yes, we do. Okay. Now we're going to pivot to talk about, someone has a question about blockchain. Good. So what blockchain <laughs> application are you most excited about for HR tech? Well, I mean, not that we're going to spoiler alert. Let can me, we, let we me back up this we, train we, a little bit. We, I think we should save that one. We'll save that one. Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a major part of the discussion. Yeah. It's the most important part of yep. the discussion, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So, but we will spoiler alert if we do it too early. Yeah, yeah. Data, data matters, it turns out, in Apparently. resumes. Validity <clears throat> matters. I don't know if you guys have lied on your resume. <laughs> um, Statistically, eight out of 10 of you have. Yes. So, um, yeah. So probably. So we're right. watching. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we do have another question about recruiting and ATS. Can you okay. speak a little bit about any concerns from recruiters and other professionals in regards to AI replacing the human recruiter? Do you think that's coming? Well, I think that it depends if you're talking about an internal recruiter or a third party agency recruiter, because they are different. Um, I think we will see consolidation, i.e. the reason you have so many humans to do certain things is because a certain task requires a certain amount of human labor. If you introduce automation, so for example, I have a hole to dig right here, and I hand you all shovels, it's gonna take quite a few of you to dig me quite a big hole. If I hand one of you a, a, an earth mover, a caterpillar, it's gonna take one of you, right? So, but you're still gonna need a human in the process, because at the end of the day, humans are hiring humans to do certain jobs, right? So you'll probably see a consolidation of humans because of technology, but you won't see the full displacement of humans because of it. And, um, and again, you know, as we continue to grow into ever uh, more, you know, science fiction markets such as, you know, clean tech, space exploration, vertical farming, battery technologies, all these different areas which will require specialist human knowledge and recruiters in order to find that talent, which generic artificial intelligence just won't be smart enough to make the decisions on whether or not that is the right hire. They will just be able to filter sure. the, the great unwashed, so to speak. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've talked a lot about where we have been, and we've we've trashed ATS uh, <laughs> systems for quite a while now. Yeah. Um, but they've been quite useful, and that's why oh, they've yeah. the utility yeah. of them. Uh, his, his, you know, employed workforces yeah. were 
three generations. Yep. You know? So where where is it that we are now? What are some of the most exciting technologies that we're seeing today? Well, I think, you know, a company that I admire a lot um, is a company called Eightfold AI. Um, they are, they're funded by SoftBank. Um, they're making some significant moves towards utilizing artificial intelligence for increasing diversity, equality, and inclusion. Um, one of the biggest problems, and I don't think it's talked about enough, is the fact that there is unconscious bias within AI matching technologies. How does that happen? It's quite simple when you, because people are always like, why would it be biased against that female over there or that African-American man over there? Why, why? And it's like, the problem is, is it's the data sets that they're using in order to train the AI. So to give you an example, statistically, 69% of the labor force in tech are white men. So if you take a universe of resumes of all the successful hires that have been in IT and you use that as a data set to train AI, there are common threads of language and structures of resumes that are uniquely to Caucasian men. And so it will start to look for resumes written by white men. And this was proven by Amazon. Amazon tried to build their own human resource technology matching software. They spent four years doing it and they proved it was unconsciously biased against women and they scrapped it. And that isn't just unique to gender. It is also an issue with BIPOC. And I think the Eightfold is the absolute pioneer of achieving this. We're all in a world now where we understand that a diverse labor force is the best labor force to build businesses and companies with. We don't want to make the mistakes of the past of unconscious bias or having our own home of Philly take over our ability to make better judgments on who we hire. So we need to build technology that allows us to reflect a diverse workforce, not make the mistakes of the past that we have. So they're definitely one that I'm super, uh, you know, have a lot of admiration for. I really, they're very successful and I hope they get more and more and more successful. You know, even technically they could be uh, a competitor that would uh, be a problem for job.com, but I would be proud that we lost to them if it meant that they did better things in the market, helping people feed their families and pay their bills. So they're one. And then the other one is I just is is a is a payroll technology company called Deal. Um, they've had some immense success, incredible growth. Um, and I think they're hugely they've just dialed in how they, they do payroll technology to allow you to spin up remote workforces all over the planet. But the bit that I love about what they're doing, and they've only dipped their toe into it is that they are exploring the, the use of cryptocurrencies in the payroll tech as well. You know, I'm a big uh, proponent of you know, um, digital assets and crypto. And I think that the idea of having that as an option to take your paycheck through a payroll technology company, I think is super innovative. Does it matter to us today? Probably not. Will it matter to Generation Alpha, who by 2030 in a mere seven years will be 20 years old? Probably yes. Um, and I think that that's cool. So they're, they're my two. I like seven years. Seven years, Generation Alpha is 20 years old. Mm. And they would have never known a life about TikTok, crypto, metaverses. They will have the most outrageous points of view, different to us in a good way. Yeah. You know, but just their idea of their universe and the way they look for work will be completely different in the fact that they won't look for work. Work will look for them. So their worlds will come to them. The idea of going to a search engine to type in what I'm looking for, to find a job board, to sign up, to then divert me to an app contracting system to sign up to that, to then wait in a black hole and never know if I even got looked at by a recruiter will be ridiculous to them. Mm -hmm. They will expect chat GPT to immediately engage with them through their social media and onboard them in minutes because that's the seamless way of doing it and utilizing historical data and predictive analytics, they will be successfully placed into companies immediately. That will be their destiny in future. Would you say that in seven years? They will be 20 years old in seven years. And I would anticipate, yeah, I know, it's crazy, right? My children, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm blessed I have five children, right? And- uh, That's a lot. Yeah, I know. We have no TVs in our house. So, um, <laughs> and, uh, so uh, I think my wife might actually be watching, so she'd be horrified that I said that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I love her. So, um, and, uh, but no, but like I have Generation Alpha children and, um, you know, they, it's quite incredible 
I gave a speech at the Rust Belt Conference uh, in Detroit, and I put a picture of my son up on the screen at the time he was three, and I said on there that he could not write his name, but he could type his name. What mattered? Because for all of us growing up, it was about handwriting and it's sort of, he couldn't handwrite his name for love nor money, but he could type it on an iPad, no problem, could spell it easily. And it was like, did it matter that he couldn't handwrite it? Probably not. Because the reality is the data and information that he needed to provide was given effectively in a digital world, you know. So yeah, generation alpha, go alpha. <laughs> Let's just hope we've made Let's, it out by the time they're here. I know there's, <laughs> some, I know there's some more questions and I want to get to yeah, the blockchain yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff, but you've got, since we've brought it up and we've talked a little bit about Gen Alpha and how their whole experience growing up will always include a TikTok, right? Yeah. Will always include, you know, the, the majority of the media they will consume won't be static media, right? Like they're not going to go to Instagram and be like, that's a lovely picture of yourself. They're going to go to always see, you know, like moving pictures, yeah. right? And um, so tell us a little bit about how that will work in the future. Are we going to have video resumes? Yeah. Is it something, I know it's in its nascency, you know, kind of now, but is that, is it going to be a reality, you think? I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, so again, the idea of this generation having to upload a document, write it, then submit it, it just, or instant gratification, make a video. And uh, I got into this debate. Uh, with uh, another uh, staffing tech conference about two years ago, just after the pandemic. And someone was like, no, people aren't really going to want to get on camera. I'm like, our generation won't want to get on camera. No, their generation who literally live on Snapchat, TikTok, YouTube, video is their medium, right? And um, this was then subsequently proven by the pilot that TikTok did, which was TikTok resumes. And I think the most compelling part of it was the proof that the market wanted it. TikTok resumes had a page called TikTok resumes. It has 360 million likes. <laughs> if you ever want a data set of proof that the audience want to have something like that. And so they began to serve video resumes that were produced on TikTok to WWE, Chipotle, Target, and it was immensely successful. The issue is that all of the Fortune 500 and many other businesses still sit on what we call Web 2, um, applicant tracking system, HR tech infrastructure. So it all goes back to the applicant tracking system. It has to, yeah. Like, okay. you know, and there are more, <laughs> there are more sophisticated applicant tracking systems than others, right? Not all ATSs are the same. Like if you look at Workday, Connector, Taleo, Success Factors, Smart Recruiters, Greenhouse, iSIMS, they're all the leading you know, ATS systems. And pretty much most of the major employees in the United States are on at least one of them. Okay. And um, and so in order to make a video resume work, you have to kind of shoehorn together the idea of these two technologies. Because let's say you put a job out and you're Bank of America, and you get 100 people send you a 30 second video. <laughs> Who's watching 130 second videos? <laughs> None of us, you know, we haven't got time for that. So you need traditional technologies in order to transcribe those videos, pause and match those videos, rank those videos based on relevancy to a job description that's been written. So it will be, the kind of amalgamation of those two technologies together, but totally possible. Um, and further to that, um, so Goldman Sachs ran a campaign for advertising for Generation Z applicants through Instagram. And to think that one of the most prestigious investment banks in the world would have even considered Instagram as their only source of talent, but they did. And it was hugely successful. And here's why. Young talent don't necessarily know who the hell Goldman Sachs is. And they don't know what they stand for. So the campaign they ran was around the things that Goldman invests in, such as searching for cures for cancer, trying to stop climate change. And they resonated with Generation Z. And because they resonated with Generation Z, it was a hugely successful campaign. So again, proving further that social media is a route to telling your next hires who may not know who your brand are. And this is Goldman Sachs. Imagine if you're a small 500 million revenue company, even smaller, no one's ever heard of you. How do you convey beyond a couple of, it's great to work at Caldwell, Keegan's a really nice guy, really you need a personality, a brand, an expression. Video is the way to do that. So if you create the opportunity for someone to apply with a video, they can also learn about the company with video too. 
And this is going to be something that this generation Z, generation alpha, they consume their entire lives through this. And in the end, they'll become fully VR immersed in consuming this content, you know, instead of just in the 2D, mm -hmm. it will be completely immersed as well. But this will be the route that they, they choose in order to find their next opportunity. And it sounds crazy, probably to all of us, you think, you know, it's novel or pointless, but it's not novel if that's your norm. And this is their norm. Mm. This, you said something interesting there, and that's that they're not going to sit down think about what to write down and then wait for a long time. No. What that makes me think about though is how I've written a lot of resumes. I've sat and, and thought about exactly what it was that I wanted to say for the particular job and put myself in the shoes of the reader so that they could hear exactly what they wanted to hear so that I would get a call back, right? Instead of just getting ghosted on another application that I sent out and feeling depressed for several weeks. <laughs> this is my own personal experience. Well, <laughs> so, the, 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 the thing that's missing that you can yeah. get from a video is you get more sophisticated, I'm sure we understand this with video technology, is sentiment. Sentiment analysis behind someone's body language, but the way they say words, the way that they say things with conviction, all of this stuff can be, uh, right. can be amassed through uh, video uh, oh, analysis. I guess what I'm getting at though is that when we're taking that time, what, what I'm getting at is that I'm manipulating the data. Yeah, of course. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's, that, Which that's, is what that, everybody does with point, their resumes. Right? Yeah. So this, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue <laughs> to the data problem yeah, portion of this okay. talk, right? By saying that that's what, you know, that's what we've been doing for a long time, yes. right? Yeah. Even if it's just like subtle little changes, it's great if there's tools for formatting things in such a way that there's not the opportunity for human manipulation in, in, those, in those ways, right? Yeah. Uh, and so talk to us a little bit about how there's these new data providence technologies and um, how will either your company, job.com, or how are other companies um, uh, adopting these technologies to have, have better data and to give um, the right candidates the opportunity for the right positions at, at the right companies? So this has been, so what Keegan has sort of segued in has been my personal um, passion project for, and something I've written many articles about and a lot of research into, which is, the validity of resume data. <clears throat> I say resume because it's the current medium we use, right? But let's just say the validity of someone's career history, okay? Um, we all have background checks, etc., and to the best of our ability, we try and validate um, someone's career history, their background, their achievements, their accomplishments, etc. But the reality is, is that statistically, every year studies are done uh, to test the validity of random resumes. And the delta is 77 to 85% of people lie in their resume every single time. Some of those lies are small. Like, I ride my Peloton three times a week. It's like, no, your Peloton is a clothes hanger. So, um, fact. And, and that's okay, because we can live with those sorts of fibs, because, yeah, I don't know if you use the word fib here, but it's a British terminology for lie. Um, we understand but, what you're saying. Yeah, so. sorry. Have to I'll translate it. translate it here for us, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but those lies are more than acceptable in the hiring process. What are not acceptable is claiming uh, certain titles or job professions uh, that you have done. And it's very difficult to track that sort of track record when you have millions of small businesses in the United States that also boom bust, right? You know, like if I worked at Facebook, it's going to be pretty easy to find out if I worked at Facebook. If I worked for John Doe, 5 million revenue company around the corner, that went out of business two years ago, which is very common, it's super hard to validate that information. So why is this? Well, because there isn't what's called a single source of truth behind anyone's career history. The closest we have is LinkedIn, um, but statistically, there's a, you know, a statistic that floats around that says that 26% of profiles on LinkedIn are fake for the purposes of fake recommendations and fake endorsements. Mm. So the well has been poisoned and there's no, a protocol that challenges any of the claims that you make on LinkedIn. It's merely just a shop window and you can put anything you like in there. You don't have to, it doesn't necessarily have to be factual. Um, but job seekers are consumers, right? Because every, you know, it's pretty much if you're an adult, everyone needs a job, right? Um, so we do, we are used to living with a single source of truth in our lives. It's called a credit score, right? We have a single source of truth behind our credit, particularly with FICO, TransUnion. And that's achieved through what's called a cooperative governance framework, which is where you get multiple participants in an industry who are typically competitors to provide information to a central repository. And that was achieved with the credit score in 1989. And you have Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase, and all other financial institutions providing information about Keegan, me, all of you, 
to a central repository like FICO to help all of them remove friction from hiring. This, did, this didn't happen until the late 90s? Yeah. Really? 1989, yeah. Mm. Credit score. Oh, 1989. Yeah, 1989. Yeah, okay. sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, 1989. Okay. That's when it was introduced. And so before that, people just. just well, it was, it was all basically. Like, you had relationships with your bank manager. I don't know if people remember this, but like if you wanted to get a loan or something like that, as, as, you know, maybe some of the individuals here would have had relationships with their financial provider and they were lent that you know, uh, uh, loan based on those relationships. And it was based a lot on trust. But the problem was, is as banks grew and as you know, fraudulent claims were, became more and more rife, there had to be a technology-driven solution that helped make remove friction from hiring. That's why, uh, sorry, remove friction from lending. And that's why you had, that's why you can go on to Capital One and have a decision in a minute on a credit card because they base it all on data and base it on a single source of truth. So moving forward into the job market, we have millions of employers. We have hundreds of thousands of, um, sorry, we have hundreds of thousands of recruiters and tens of thousands of staffing agencies. We have hundreds of ATSs, hundreds of job boards. All of them are harboring information around all of us and will have cross-pollination information around all of us too. So you may have a profile on ZipRecruiter and you may have also signed up to Workday and you may have also applied for a job through Roundstart and you may have worked for Wells Fargo. And they all have some part of your career history. Mm -hmm. Now, creating a cooperative governance framework, which meant that as soon as that information enters a database of theirs, they then provide that information and feedback to a central repository around you, akin to a FICO. Um, some of the stuff that we have worked on, obviously, at job.com, and as you know, because you're a patent lawyer, um, is around creating a single source of truth around someone's career history that is stored on blockchain. So an irrefutable ledger that is a career wallet that can travel with you anywhere, and it is a singular representation of you as a human, and it is constantly being uh, adapted and, and updated from multi- uh, stakeholders, multiple um, people in the framework to create a single source of truth behind someone. And that can then allow you to have almost a passport for applications on any platform frictionlessly because you have been validated. And it doesn't come down to subjective validation. Like, oh, Keegan was a great team player because that's subjective. I just want to know, was he a patent lawyer? and Did he work at Caldwell at this time? Because quantitative analysis is the true way of measuring someone because we can all be subjective and the reality is we have bad bosses we have bad employees people don't get along that shouldn't be used as a way of measuring someone it also encourages further bias which we don't want bias we just want the quantitative facts did you do this job did you go to this college did you get this grade did you did you spend this time there yep done all the rest can be achieved for an interview to determine whether or not it seems like you're a good fit you know so one of our Big goals and my you know, grand mission is to try and bring order to chaos within the hiring process and create the largest database of validated career data in America. And so to become the FICO of resumes or career history. And it has so many prominent benefits. For example, we use resume data to, to provide supervised machine learning training data sets for AI, right? Well, I just told you that 77 to 85% of people lie in those resumes. So if I tell you that potentially 85% of the data is misinformation at, at some point, garbage in, garbage out. So one of the biggest in, uh, immediate impacts will be if you have validated career data that you can literally swear by, um, then it means that the artificial intelligence has an increased chance of further accuracy. Further to this, um, the statistically, the average time to hire in the United States is 42 days. A large component of that is just going through trying to validate if someone's real and has done everything they said they have. If you have an irrefutable ledger that has taken someone through a commonly accepted framework that we all adhere to, that says they are who they say they are, you can sk skip huge, amount, uh, huge amounts of the hiring time, mm. which every company in America measures revenue per employee. And every day that someone doesn't work, it means they're not making revenue for you. So if you save, we did the math for like Apple. So Apple has 22.2% staff turnover and they, if you took the 42 average days, if you were to save them one day on the hiring cycle on those 22.2% uh, people, you would increase their revenue opportunity by $144 million per day because you have someone working one extra day because you saved it on the hiring cycle. Mm. Validated data. <laughs> we're already doing it in the finance industry. So we just need to do it in the job industry and create a singular source of truth behind everybody's career history. 
The other part to this, I'm going to go a little bit more into the future for Generation Alpha, is when we all signed up to all these platforms and websites, we were just grateful to have the use of a free email and free social network and stuff like that, unknowingly, really not knowing that they were making billions of dollars out of our data. Well, Generation uh, Z and especially Generation Alpha, they know that their data is worth a lot of money. So if you create a wallet that has your career history in it, you could, in respects, uh, NFT that data. Um, and any time anyone makes money out of your data and your career history, you could have a share and participation of that money. So you would have a reason to have the most up-to-date career record and validated data because you get paid for it. And I believe that will be the future of how people manage their career histories. Hmm. Hmm. So you're building it? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I, I do a lot of, I look at a lot of resumes and I always, you know, I always know that, you know, how, how um, accurate is this information. Mm -hmm. I do go to, like, the only place where you go is to link it to try to validate it. Yeah. But that, that takes time. Time. You're still at the whim of trusting. If you, oh. You're still at the whim. I think I was done. Yeah. It's okay. It's because they can't hear you on the live stream. Yeah. They, yeah. They, 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 they want to hear you. You're at the whim of, uh, so anyone was on the live stream, they was talking about how she has a resume, she looks at it and she has to then try and utilize her own process of validating that by uh, viewing LinkedIn to see if there's a correlation. And you're relying on a public profile as a way of going, well, I have to assume then it's real. But the reality is people blatantly lie and create public profiles for the purposes of creating misinformation. And, um, and it may not be 85% of the time, but the cost of a misplaced employee in a company is huge. And statistically, when someone leaves a business, it's a third of their annual salary in an in immediate cost to the company. You know, so that's so it's more. So I think the average cost to hire in the United States is four thousand one hundred and twenty nine dollars, to be precise. But the average cost of when someone leaves is a third of their salary. So we're always looking at the cost of recruitment. We're not looking at the cost of what failed retention is. Is it is infinitely more. You know, it could be up to 10 times more. So again, successful onboarding and utilizing emerging technologies in order to facilitate validated data. So you're not sat there going, is this true? You have a certified protocol that has done this for you that is commonly accepted. Nobody gets their credit score and goes, well, that's wrong. Never. <laughs> so we're like, well, it must be right. You just know it's right because you already know, like, oh, yeah, maybe I missed that one car payment that time. Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah, that's probably right. And, you know, just the general stuff. Like, we're all sure. being honest, right? So um, do you never challenge that? We need to achieve that level of just acceptance in people's resumes and data. What about uh, data on, like, self-reporting sites like Glassdoor? Is, there, is that accurate or is it known to be? Do you know well, anything about that? Well, this is the other thing, right? Yeah, this is this is the other thing, right? It's um, we really need a way of creating because we're all now have digital alter egos, right? And we have a social norm of determining trust by either building relationships with humans and knowing over enough time that we believe that we trust them, or through um, social validation. Oh, Keegan's a great guy, and you trust me, and I've told you Keegan's great, you now trust Keegan, to a degree. Um, that doesn't, <laughs> you shouldn't. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> <Chicken>. um, <laughs> you, <laughs> stop. Don't devolve. Don't, don't send me off. <laughs> so, because um, once I start, I won't stop laughing. It'll be 30 minutes of me laughing. So, um, uh, it, we need to achieve that, obviously, online. Um, and you know, th th these are you know these this glass door trust pilot other sites that allow you to provide feedback um, should really only allow you to provide feedback with a trusted verified profile online, not just a well you've signed up you've given us an email address which you could have made in five minutes and thank you for validating that double opt in email for us because you could have done that in five minutes and now you're willing to say anything about anybody you like slam them destroy them or promote them to provide false information. Let me give you an example. There are offshore companies that sell the service of providing you five-star recommendations on Trustpilot. <laughs> you can literally buy them. Would you like 100 Trustpilot recommendations that are delivered naturally? Yes, I would. <laughs> Who wouldn't? You know, it exists. 
because there is no true validation of these digital alter egos. So I believe that jobs being one of the corner pillar stones of everything we do online, from e-commerce to dating, this will provide a true validated profile for me. And I shouldn't be allowed to provide any form of feedback online until I'm truly validated myself. Because otherwise we're only providing potentially the opportunity of misinformation. Okay. Katie, is there, let's go back to the live stream since we're, we've abandoned them for a bit now. Yep. Uh, we hit Aaron's sweet spot here with the blockchain stuff. Do we have any follow-ups on that? <laughs> we do. Okay. So first, what blockchain application are you most excited about for HR tech? Digital identity or experience validation? Um, digital identity. Yeah, pretty much you know, what we're, we're talking about here. Um, I also uh, believe the application of... Um, so one of the things that we tried to do at job.com, which was one of my famous failures, but it was a good learning lesson, was we tried to build our own cryptocurrency. Um, we tried to... I've never heard about this. Did you? I don't think so. Don't ever try, don't try to sweep this under the rug. <laughs> it was pretty it was pretty big. Like, you know, we sounds like it. Yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> it was one of those painful years of my life and my career. And uh, but it was a great idea, but we were just too early. Okay, that's why that's why I said in court. So uh, <laughs> I'm joking. So um it was uh, it was a great so basically, long story short. Um I believe that cryptocurrencies have a huge place uh, within the hiring process. I think that the future generations will be more than happy to accept digital assets as a way of payment, uh, because if something has a value, it has a value. Um, there are also a number of major benefits in order to doing uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. But what we tried to do at job.com is we built our own cryptocurrency. This was in 2018. Um, we did an initial coin offering, um, and we offered it out to the market, and we did very well, sold lots and lots of job TK, out to the market. Um, my goal and objective was to pass back some of the value in reward to people that is created when you hire people. So what do I mean by that? Well, statistically, the average percentage that a staffing recruitment agency will charge for a permanent placement candidate in the market is 20%. So if you're $100,000 a year, the recruiter gets paid 20,000 bucks when you get hired. But the person that got hired, the talent, did the interview, has all the skills, experience, the education, is the talent they want, and they get zero out of it. They just get the job. And to most normal tens and purposes, you think, well, yeah, you know, they got the job, but actually it was them that facilitated all of it. They're the asset. So what we tried to create was a facility where we rewarded people with cryptocurrency. We would actually give them the lion's share of the fee that we got paid in the form of crypto. And uh, it was just too early. And um, then the crypto winter hit in September 2018, and we did our hard cap raise, and it just <laughs> raised like 15 bucks on it. <laughs> it was a nightmare. We did like 2 million in our soft cap in like 30 seconds in the April, because everyone was hot on it. And then in September, it just died, it just finished. And it cost us a lot of money <laughs> and a lot of development time for it to fail. And um, I still firmly believe that rewarding candidates for being a good uh, human, so for example, if you provide a truly validated profile or validated data, you reward people for providing positive information and data and experiences into a hiring ecosystem. And you do that in the form of cryptocurrency. Um, so that was you know, one of my visions for, I still believe it will happen. I, I believe it will happen. I believe that uh, ecosystem, like for example, uh, referrals. People get referred into companies and sometimes get paid a referral fee, right? As a, as a, as a candidate, it happens forever. So there's bounty sites everywhere. Bounty jobs, Zubka was one, uh, Your People Market was another one in the UK, all these referral sites. Well, imagine if you created an ecosystem where it was quite social and it was like, hey, you know, we're looking for this person. We're like, well, I'm not good for that job, but I know just the person. And you recommend them and you get paid in cryptocurrency. Great. Just put it, you know, there are people driving around. That, imagine telling someone 15 years ago that your phone would buzz and you'd go pick up a stranger and drop them off somewhere. You think you've landed off the moon. Well, that's Uber. You know, you know, people are willing to do lots of things in order to earn, you know, you know, sub, you know, subsidized frank, you know, income. So, you know, and uh, so I think gig income. So I think that that's, yeah, again, crypto and blockchain has a major application there. It's probably just a little bit too early. Sure. Yeah. Uh, do we have anything else on the live stream? We do. We have one more question. Are there any cybersecurity concerns that are, will affect the new generation of HR tech? 
Well, cybersecurity is just an issue in general, right? And I'm not actually the expert, more of that. The guy's probably more of an expert sat over there. So um, my CTO. But what I can tell you is um, the most, one of the most intimate documents that you ever write about yourself and you share that can tell me what you earn, where you live, and also utilizing predictive analytics, what your future may be, is your resume. And it's worth a fortune to the wrong hands. So it has become a prominent um, attack for cybersecurity because you have 20,000 staffing agencies in America, of which 19,800 of them do less than 100 million in revenue, but are sat sometimes on up to a million resumes any one time. And they have not got cybersecurity dialed in by any stretch of imagination. They barely have Excel, you know? So it's true. They're small businesses, that's fine. But the reality is they are sat on valuable assets that can be, you know, held captive and held to ransom through ransomware. So the concern for cybersecurity in our industry is more than ever. And the attacks on businesses in recruitment, HR tech staffing are more than ever, sadly. Do we have any questions in the room? Okay, we're good. we've got some hands. Can we pass them a mic? Hi, how's it going? Uh, since we are at MIT, do you think the university you attend will hold, hold less weight in the future when video resumes and other processes become the norm? And will this impact enrollment at universities? That's a really good question. So I have two views on it, and so I'm going to give it from two lenses. Something like an institution like MIT holds a huge amount of prestige because this is one of the greatest tech universities in the entire world. And the reason it is, is because of the faculty and the students, because they are the brightest, right? That's just the facts, okay? Um, so you're never gonna get over the fact that if you are the brightest and you're at the university recognized as the brightest, it's of course going to play a determining factor in the hiring process, no matter whether, no matter what medium that you use. But I always love the concept of the quote unquote diamond in the rough, right? Maybe those, later bloomers in life who weren't necessarily quite as focused at that point in their life, but had a life-changing event and became more focused, you know? <laughs> Sat next to one right now. But you're a great example of that, right? I am, I am. You are yeah. a fan, you're a fabulous example of that. Yep. Yep. So, um, and there are a lot of humans that exist just like this that have so much value to offer, but maybe didn't do it in quite the same fashion as others, right? So. I think that it all comes down to, in the end, no matter what technology you've got, it does come down to the human to make that determination of, who do I have sat in front of me? Yes, this is an MIT grad. Oh, this person isn't an MIT grad. However, they seem to have something about them that makes them special. So I think that's my answer to that one. We've got, uh, actually, I'm gonna go to Dale real quick here. And then, you after Dale, yeah. Uh, doesn't the federal government have probably the largest source of information in terms of tax records you know, as proof of work? Yeah, I, they, they certainly do. It's just would they share it? You know, never. So that, that's, that's probably the biggest issue for us as independent third-party private companies is that um, and eventually, if you, let's say, created a framework that was really, truly validated data, I would imagine the government's going to be all over that <laughs> eventually, right? They're going to want a piece of that action. Um, but if we were to go to the government first and say, hey, could you give us a leg up by trying to help us with all this information? They'd tell you, that's the door, please leave. I would imagine. But that was a great point, absolutely. Hi, Clara here, um, and I'm from MIT, so <laughs> thank you for the compliment. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> my question regards, you, you gave an example of your son knowing how to use the computer versus writing. Okay, so with all of these systems, um, there could be the um, uneventable, uh, perhaps, uh, doing with the haves versus half nots. So when you also talk about diamonds in the rough, I mean, how are you dealing with situations like those that have come out of incarceration, immigrants, and those like even with credit cards, some people can't get credit cards, so they don't have a credit score. So there are 
could be a good segment that is lost that would want to contribute to the workforce. How would you deal with that? Yeah, and I love this. So um, I was fortunate enough to write an article for Forbes uh, around Second Chance, for example. So we'll maybe we'll hone in on that one specifically, but let's just make this a blanket topic for those that may be less fortunate or have circumstances that inhibit them from other people in the in employment market. So 77 million people in America have an arrest record. And it's now such an issue uh, that it, uh, when you go through a background check for companies that it's actually causing talent shortages because people have been arrested for anything. And now because they have an arrest record are now no longer uh, able to work at certain companies. And it is a real issue because the reality is, is that what are you doing with those with that? Well, one, you are creating a cyclical effect. Prevent someone from gaining full, from gainful employment. What will they do? They will continue to offend. Okay, um, because if you you know put someone in a cage for long enough, they're going to turn wild, right? Because there's nothing that they can do. They can't get themselves. They can't work themselves out of their issue, which they should absolutely have the right to do. Secondly, people have a right to make a mistake. Okay, and I think that there should be a gravity towards those mistakes, which I would imagine will be part of the validation process. So I think in this country, most people, even the most unprivileged, have probably access to a computer somewhere or, you know, in a library or maybe a phone or a smartphone that would allow them to create a digital um, version of themselves that could go for validation. Right. And part of that validation may be looking at their history or record, criminal record, et cetera. Um, and I think that there needs to be some level of scoring that sits around that. I.e., if you were in California 20 years ago and you got caught with cannabis, I don't even know why you still even got it on your goddamn record. You know? It's all... <sighs> you know? But apparently you can't get employed because you still have an arrest record. It's like, oh my goodness. You know? This is also affecting people from hiring because companies will have a protocol in place that won't allow this talent to come into the company. So you're missing out on a great hire and that hire is missing out on an honest, gainful employment opportunity. So these are also areas where if we use, beyond just the validation of resume data, if we just create a much more sophisticated protocol that just analyzes human beings on every level and starts applying a much more logical process to whether or not we analyze someone for the purposes of gainful employment rather than just these blanket statement yes or no's which really don't suit society today because when 77 million people have been arrested at some point you have to ask yourself the question is there an issue with the system probably yes you know more than any other country on the planet to the point where i believe that your arrest records surpass almost most of Europe in its entirety, which is a lot. So, um, so yeah, so that's my, my point. And then for those as well who may not have access, you know, we don't all have access to smartphones, stuff like that. But I will use the example of when you look at how many people are on Facebook, Instagram, stuff like that, I would say, because I come from a place in the UK called Luton, and uh, probably none of you ever heard of it, but it's, it was voted the worst place to live in the whole of England every year, statistically. <laughs> because you were from there. Yes, yeah, I was a reprobate, so um, somewhat. And uh, it, but it, very uh, under economically developed, economically deprived uh, area. But even in a, an area like that, which was one of the most poorest and undeveloped areas in the whole of the UK, everyone still had a Facebook page. <laughs> you know, most of my friends who I grew up with who come from you know poor homes, uh, broken homes, um, homes that were driven by, fueled by drugs and drug abuse and stuff like that, still had a Facebook and had an Insta and stuff like that. Or in the UK, we had a thing called Bebo, which I don't think you guys had here, but it got bought by AOL and then destroyed. <laughs> so, um, but nonetheless, we had them. So, which means there is a point where you have a responsibility as a human being that if you need to get yourself out of a situation, you need to go and find a way to get yourself out of a situation. There are public libraries. There are places that you can go to utilize resources to create a profile for yourself. <clears throat> you could probably walk into a recruitment agency and say, I'm broke, I'm poor, and I need to create a profile for themselves. I'm pretty certain that most branches of Kelly Services and ADECO would welcome you with open, open arms and allow you to create a profile for yourself. So there are ways to do it. You just have to be somewhat proactive to work your way out of that situation. Sure, yeah. Hmm. And this is a... I mean, it's such a challenging 
thing to address also, right? Um, it's, it's actually something, and I don't want to overtake this whole talk. But you're a, but it's actually something that's very near and dear to, to um, myself and, and things that we've done at our firm. Um, I'm a convicted felon myself, but I'm, I'm also a, a patent attorney and own uh, um, I'm the founder of the fastest growing intellectual property law firm in the last three years in a row in the United States. Um, when I first applied for college, I had I didn't know how to do that or anything like that, right? Like my, it's easy to say just go to the library or something like that, um, but I didn't have the first clue of how to do any of those things, right? Like yeah. I, I, I knew there was these computers there, right? And I didn't use them for useful purposes. I mostly just messed around and, yeah. you know, tried to figure out what they were all about a little bit every once in a while. But most of my life, it wasn't... Mm, I wasn't utilizing technology in that way, yeah. right? And uh, um, and I had more access to those things than a lot of people, yeah. right? It is is the other thing too. And like even I was speaking with a client. Uh, um, you will. So at our uh, at our firm too, you know. You know what? I, I'm going to go back. I, I love what you said about life is a team sport, right? Yeah. That's what it is. That's a, I mean, un, this is the unfortunate answer I think to this question, right? Is that life is a team sport, and one in this particular like social issue is something that I think that we all need to put our best foot forward on, right? And to remember to be to to remember forgiveness um, more than contempt for others in, in writing them off. Because uh, uh, one thing that I've learned throughout my own life is I know ex I know exactly what it feels like to uh, think that I'm right and to be wrong. Um, and I hope that I don't do that that much more in my life, but I know I will, right? And so I'm always willing to learn more, you know? And so I guess I would just ask everyone in the audience to kind of open your heart to that concept that what you know should be subject to revision. And, uh, and what we know about others and those that work around us should also be. And you're, you're not setting yourself enough. You are a PhD grad, yep. founded your own business from scratch with no capital invested. You built it with that one of the most successful firms in the country, according to Inc., the fastest growing law firm. Yeah. You employ tons of people, you're a great boss, everybody loves you. But most you, of them. <laughs> they do. But it was one of the things that I love about him the most is his story is, it, but, but he is a convicted felon, right? He did make a mistake, right? He did, okay? And he did what he had to do for it too. And transparency for anyone who has it, I'm also a convicted felon too. So I made mistakes too when I was young because I grew up in a really, really bad town. And, um, but that was 20 years ago. Right, since then, married, kids, and also have built a business now that you know has over nine figures in revenue, right? And I employ hundreds and hundreds of people, and I put thousands of people to work, and the positive impact that we both have on society yeah. today outstretches any of the negative that we did a thousand times over. But it's mainly why we both work, work for ourselves, though, too, is because we were unemployable. Yeah, we were unemployable, places, right? Yeah, and so, true. I mean, that, and that's job. kind of the point, is that that's what we were forced into. <laughs> yeah. This is really kind of sidetracking this yeah. whole conversation. But it actually turned out for the best. A, yeah, sorry. So, it's like, but I'm just like crying on his shoulder and stuff like that. Listen, no, but, it, it's, it's, but, it, but it, does, it does need some context. I think what you brought there is such a great point. And I'm so grateful as well. Someone of your sophistication at MIT is looking at it that way because it can be easy to cast away individuals. But the reality is, is that there are diamonds in the rough. That's why your question about uh, struck a chord with my heart because I love MIT and the great prestige and the brilliant talent you bring out of this institution it's has had a huge place. impact on this yeah. world, mm -hmm. right? And it continues to do so. But every now and again, there are human beings like <clears throat> ourselves that sadly slip through that net, but we also are slightly late bloomers and we also deliver a lot to this universe. And, um, and so utilizing technologies to try and provide some more context behind that so that we don't allow 77 million Americans to sit on the bench because I guarantee you there are more diamonds in that rough and there could be talent that could really make a positive impact. You know, so yeah. Yeah, I don't know. There's work to do and don't, don't, leave me. don't give up. Don't leave okay. me. So, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we didn't rehearse that part. Okay. I know. I'm like, you saw my hand, I didn't like that. <clears throat> Slapped his head. <laughs> so, um, no, he's good. Well, uh, I thought there was another question that we had somewhere in the audience here. Katie, you got one on the live stream. Okay, go ahead. Live yeah. stream go to ahead. follow up on that. Do you think apprenticeships could ever gain traction in the U.S.? They seem to only be accepted a fraction of the workforce here than in the U.K. and across all of Europe. 
So I have a really strong view on this, okay? And not everyone's gonna agree with me, but I have been a young human being. And yes, apprenticeships sometimes can be abused by companies as a way of kind of free labor. But when you're brand new in the market and you have zero experience, and you don't have much to offer your new employer, right? Because you know nothing. In fact, as an employer myself now, young human beings who have so much promise of learning and energy should be grateful for the opportunity to work in commerce, even if it's for free, because the amount of lessons they will get to learn. They're in such a hurry for money, which I get sometimes because they may not have the privilege and have bills to pay. I completely agree. But if you are in the position where you can just go and get that experience on the dime of an employer, because trust me, they're not making any money out of you. They're just teaching you, go and do it. Do it more. Don't be entitled. Be grateful for opportunity because it's not just the job you're going to experience. It's the network. It's the character building. It's all of these things that are worth infinitely more to you on your journey that you will capitalize on later and you should be doing them. So yes, I am a big proponent of apprenticeships. I wish they were done more. I just think that it got a bad stigma because you know people were like, well, they're barely paying or it's kind of free labor or you know, it's not. It's just a foot in the door for a young human to get experience and they should be grateful for it. Yes, no. it's true. How because is that different than uh, like an internship though? Isn't that about the same equivalent? Yeah, the same, yeah. 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 Okay. Friendships, internships, yeah. Sure. Like apprenticeships, right? They like, and again, this may be- I think of it for like the building trades. Like we have, you know, you're an apprentice and then you become a journeyman or a master or whatever, right? But yeah. uh, not for the, the, you know, if you're not in the trades, then we don't really refer to it that way here, at least in the United States. Yeah, I mean, for us, apprenticeships will be typically, you, you go in and you, you might get paid something. And I think the same, internships might be shorter, right? Isn't it not much shorter for you guys intern? Generally, might be like a yeah. summer thing. Mm -hmm. Apprenticeships is like the beginning of a career. But again, the same with the apprenticeships or internships. It, you know, these are typically uh, situations where you're learning on the job and you may earn some form of income. Um, but I know that they got a lot of stigma because sometimes people weren't being paid enough or, you know, people thought they should be, you know, and I understand it. Look, human beings are like, well, I'm working. It's like, yeah, you kind of are, but you're really learning, right? You're learning uh, at the expense of an employer because you're not hitting the ground running and bringing value to that hirer right now, okay? And there's like, well, th you know, it's my time. It's like, yeah, but it also takes the time of the employer to train you, to make you know to make you productive and it's you know it's just so that the experience is just worth so much to you that you should just get on with it you know and what you'll do is 20 years of your life will go by in a blink and then you'll look back and be so grateful for that experience because it guided you to the eventual career path and probably trajectory that you're on and you know i look back at some of the experiences that i've had in my life my first ever job um I was a, I, I laid uh, curbs, uh, curbs in the, in the ground. Like I, I, I did that. So we don't have, we don't, college isn't said the same in the UK. So it, it's the last two years of high school. It's called college. So 16, 17, 18. And during that time, my job was, I laid granite set curbs in the ground and I got paid 30 pounds a day, which was about 45 bucks. So for a whole day's work. And um, it was hard work. Didn't have anything to do with what I do now today. Yeah. It taught me to be grateful sitting in an office in a nice room with a nice lunch, sitting there drinking water instead of sweating my ass off in the middle of the sun, <laughs> trying to lay these huge curves, crushing my fingers, breaking my back with other human beings around me who are twice my age doing that as a job. I mean, gave me context to be grateful of my now somewhat luxurious future sitting in a nice warm office. So I'm grateful for that experience. Do we have anything else in the live stream? We do. We have a question about, are there any industries that you found it hard to recruit for? Um, <laughs> so it, it's interesting, right? So one of the toughest industries that we've had recently, post-pandemic, has been uh, more junior or blue-collar labor. Um, there's been a significant talent shortage. Uh, the reason being is, is that, you know, there's multiple theories. But one of those theories was obviously stimulus checks made it, you know, 
less appealing for those human beings to go to work because they were given financial stimulus, which meant they did not need to go back to the Amazon warehouse and get paid uh, you know, a somewhat modest uh, pay to do a fairly intense role every day. Um, and uh, so that has been the most challenging industry up until recent trying to find talent for. Um, we also have some significant shortages coming in the healthcare industry, right? So it's predicted by 2030 that there'll be a 1.3 million nurse shortage. And uh, that's a significant problem because you've got a 1.3 million nurse shortage and an ever increasing aging population. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, well, we're in trouble or there may be what's its basic economics, supply and demand, maybe human beings that provide such services and care will get salaries that are more reflective of the work that they do. Because sadly in society, as much as I am a capitalist, I also find it difficult to see human beings that are so responsible for the future generation like teachers and nurses, who are typically some of the most underappreciated, underpaid humans, but having to do some of the most important jobs. So maybe that realignment might result in some sort of you know, economic fairing for everybody, hmm. Who's, who knows? Didn't you say that all healthcare jobs were going to be give, taken over by doctors. Chat, chat GPT? Well, doctors, <laughs> like, like, chat GPT is going to be tucking you into bed. It's going to be, it's going to be changing your bedpan. So, um, <laughs> no, but it, it, well, when it comes to the diagnosis side, yes. But when sense. it comes to the care yeah. side, you know, I, I don't know how prepared we are for humanoid robots to be, you know, put, you know, looking after us at our bedside at a hospital i do believe that we probably will for the foreseeable future would prefer the the tender loving care of a human being right so um i think a robot won't quite take that just right you probably yeah. have a robot knowing you it probably look like you as well i don't just have the, any just the vanity yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> we have we have a handful of clients that make robots yeah sure yeah, yeah i mean robot listen, companions even but yeah yeah. Uh, yeah i mean yeah. it's coming yeah i mean again there's a lot of stuff coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe we got time for one more, Katie. Sure. Something hard. And, All right. This yeah. one, uh, would video resumes hold a greater risk of discrimination for the candidate? Brilliant question. The, probably the best question of um, the evening, in my opinion. The reality is, is that whether you discriminate on a video that you watch at first, or you discriminate in an interview, discrimination will exist. And there was a study done in 2016 called the Whiten Resume. I don't know if anyone uh, read this, um, but, and you think 2016 was not that long ago, okay? So it's, we're still dealing with the same labor force, same generation, okay? They put the identical resume out in the market, but with one with an African-American name and one with a Caucasian name. Caucasian name got 140% more callbacks from recruiters. That was the only difference, which is really sad yeah. um, that we still live in a society where there is still this bias in the back of our minds. Um, there are two types of bias, and they found this in the study. They called one bias the super racist, which was someone that just genuinely had the bee in their bonnet. That doesn't sound like a title you want to have. No. Yeah. And, um, but it was part of the academic study. It was called super racist. And then the other one was talking around uh, um, homophily, which is just generally like, why do Keegan and I like each other? Because we have a lot of things in common yeah. and that we're similar, you know? Sort of. One of us has more hair than the other. So, um, sadly. Uh, but nonetheless, but, but, and so that naturally gives us this connection. And sometimes people mistake that during the hiring process. So hiring managers like, oh, I really like that person. I think we should hire them because they just connected. But, and that can affect diversity. And they didn't do it on purpose. They didn't do it because they're racist. They just naturally, well, I had a connection with that human. The video resume will certainly potentially act as a stimulus to that. But at the same time, I think it also opens up an opportunity for us to be visible to a diverse workforce. One of the challenges that Eightfold AI is trying to solve is identifying a diverse resume. You know, can I be certain that this resume is an African-American woman? Can I be certain it's a Hispanic man? Can I be certain it's an indigenous human being? I don't know. Video is going to help you probably answer that almost immediately. So counter to that could be, it may help with your diversity, equality, and inclusion 
Because now you're like, well, look, we have a brilliant broad selection of humans here. We know that we want to give the diverse humans within our hiring process a voice and an opportunity. Let's make sure we interview these humans. Let's make sure that we take the time to speak to these humans. We have to assume that society is driving towards a more equal, equality point of view than just always looking in the past going, well, if they can see who I am, then they're going to instantly be discriminative against me. Like, yeah, probably 20 years ago. But I think we are moving into a more inclusive um, uh, workplace. And I do believe as well that the next generation, so Gen Z and Gen Alpha, have a much better view on diversity. It's not of the former that we probably had and our, our parents and grandparents certainly had, where we were you know, a much more divided, sadly, um, you know, group of human beings. It's yeah. a common denominator with all of us. We are all human, right? So, uh, yeah. Oh, that divide's very upsetting. Yeah, it is. I hate I, it, I, you know, because it, yeah. it's just, again, it serves no purpose in society and it's such a shortcoming. And, um, but I think that video absolutely has its place. And I think that sadly, the only way to overcome um, the issues with, um, you know, prejudice and everything else is to identify the humans that do. You know, so that's what they did in the study of the white resume. They, they tracked the amount of human beings that were being filtered out by the hiring managers and they saw a common denominator of just people that are from diversity always being thrown out. Then they started to label them as the super racist. All right. Well, I think that that about wraps up our uh, chat tonight, but I just want to um, kind of summarize a few major topic areas that we had. Uh, so one, one thing that we talked a lot about was data validation, which was near and dear mm -hmm. to your heart. And <clears throat> something that seems intuitive also, that there would be more adoption and more need for data validation tools as we become, uh, mm, if we're to process these things faster, and, and if we're to take if we to improve video resumes, yeah, if we're to improve yeah, the way yeah, that we do just, it and to have less bias, yeah, absolutely. that we can use that we can use. Uh, I think it's maybe a wonderful use of uh, AI ML technologies that we can utilize that to create less bias, right? Absolutely. And, uh, where where even when you're well intentioned, that uh, that it still exists. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we also talked about video resumes a lot, and I just find that just a fascinating, you know, but easy thought. Uh, kind of game to contemplate that we're like, my children they'll always live in a world where uh, they're consuming media via video. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm excited to see where job.com and the rest of uh, your industry uh, takes tools like that. Sure. Um, and then lastly, I think that we may, unintentionally um, struck on the, uh, the need for more diversity in the workforce, right? And how uh, uh, more economic diversity, more racial diversity, um, more uh, tools that help us deal with those uh, blips in the road, whether that's an arrest record, we talked about things like that, mm -hmm. uh, that there's still plenty of work to do, even outside of the where we really started, right? Sure. And, and, uh, more women in the boardroom? A hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, especially in our, in my particular profession, um, I don't, I don't know the exact stats, but it was it like twenty five percent or something, Katie? Is that sixteen percent? Yeah, exactly. Which is so sixteen percent of patent attorneys are are women, right? And uh, that's weird. Yeah, <laughs> but it, 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 this is a across the board problem. And a, a personal touch to this, which is one of the things I've been hugely passionate about, removing unconscious bias from AI, especially for uh, against women. You know, I have five children. Four of those are girls. Right? And as a person who is a prominent thought leader and driving towards merging technology and hiring, I have an obligation to develop technology that overcomes these issues. So how can I look my daughters in the eye and raising four beautiful warrior, brilliant women who are going to be fantastic leaders and I'm not solving a fundamental issue, which is technology is already biased against them. You know, unbelievable. Yeah. Well, uh, Again, thank you to thank the, the eForum for putting this all together. Thank you, Aaron, again for coming thank out. You for me. And thank you all for the wonderful questions. This became mm, a, a wonderful a conversation that I was much more drawn into than I anticipated to get when uh, when I came here this evening. So, <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, so thank you. Very, you've all exceeded my expectations. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, there's some, you know, plenty of. Uh, 
uh, sugar and some other things in the back that uh, you, you can enjoy after this, and we can chat for a little bit afterwards. Thank you so much, everyone.